Welcome, welcome to The Real Messiah. This is Michael Brown. Many of you have just finished fasting on Yom Kippur. Some of you will be listening or watching some days later, but welcome to the broadcast. It's great to be with you at a very sacred time on the biblical calendar. And I want to read to you from Psalm 32, Le David, Maskil, Ashrei Nesui, Nesui Pesha, Kesui Chata'a. So a maskil of David, happy, truly blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered over. Ashrei Adam lo yachshav Adonai lo avon ve'en brucho rimiyah. Happy, truly blessed the man whom the Lord does not hold guilty and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I want to talk to you tonight about forgiveness of sins about the assurance of forgiveness of sins, of knowing that you're in right relationship with the Lord, of knowing that you know to the core of your being, not based on your best efforts, but based on His grace, that you are forgiven, that you are washed clean, that there is atonement for your sin, that you have a heart that is clean before God, that you have a conscience that is free from guilt. Can I just talk to you about that concept for a moment? Having a conscience that's absolutely free from guilt. Some of you just finished fasting. Some of you have been in the synagogue for many, many hours. Some of you have literally beaten your breast, beaten your breast, confessing sin, asking forgiveness. And, and you've confessed many sins, and you've done that on behalf of the people of Israel, Claudius Yisrael, the the people of Israel as a whole, and yet you've been doing it individually, and you've been searching your own heart, and you've been examining for days leading up to this, areas where you've fallen short, areas where you've sinned, and, and seeking to make things right and, and make amends. Can I just talk to you for a moment about the beauty of a clean conscience? You know, it comes from two things. On the one hand, it comes from being right with God and man. So if I've done something wrong, I confess it. I make it right. And, and what does it say in Proverbs? It, it tells us, that the one who covers his transgressions will not receive mercy. That's the one, the one who confesses and forsakes. That's the one that will receive mercy and forgiveness. So on the one hand, you make things right with man. You confess things before God. You do your part. But then there's that cleansing, there's that removal of guilt, there's that sense that all is well, all is right with my soul, and you can go to sleep and sleep with a, with a clean conscience, and, and you wake up knowing that if you were to die in your sleep, knowing that if you were to leave this world, you would go straight into God's holy presence because you've been forgiven and the slate is clean. Can I talk to you honestly and candidly as, as a fellow Jew? No, I'm not a traditional Jew. If, if you're watching on, on YouTube or Facebook or live stream, you can see I'm not a traditional Jew. I'm not trying to give that appearance of being a traditional Jew. But I can say this to you with all candor from my heart as a fellow Jew. I knew it was, what it was like to have a guilty conscience. I knew what it was like to have an unclean conscience. I knew what it was like to be smitten with a sense of wrong. You say, yeah, well, that's because you were doing wicked things. Yes, I was. But in God's sight, all of us on one level or another have done wicked things. All of us on one level or another have fallen short, have been hypocritical, have been self-righteous, have been proud, have been covetous, have been greedy, have been prayerless have been lustful, have been angry, have had some sinful attitude, something in our flesh that has been part of us that in the light of God's perfection, re remember what happened to the prophet Isaiah when he was in the presence of a holy God, he cries out, Oi li kinid meiti, woe is me, I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and my eyes have seen that the king, the Lord of hosts, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So we have to ask ourselves, in the sight of God, are we clean? In the sight of God, are we forgiven? 
in the sight of God have our sins been utterly and completely removed. As a teenager, I was very proud of my sin. I, I boasted about it. I thought I was cool. Those of you that, that have lived different lives, God bless you. Those of you that didn't do some of the stupid things I did as a teenager, God bless you. But I, I speak to you honestly and candidly. I did a lot of foolish things. I was a heavy drug user. I, I was full of pride and full of lust. I stole money from my own father. I was a degenerate kid. And, and I used to boast about my sin. I thought that I was cool. That's part of the deception of sin. But, you know, it's interesting that that deception comes in many different forms. Because for some of us, the deception is, look at how good I am. Look at how clean I am. Look at how godly I am. Look at how much I pray. Look at how much I study. Look at all the commandments I keep. Look at how much, for a Christian, look at how much I go to church. Look at how much charity I, I give and charitable work that I do. And we can boast in our own righteousness. We can boast about, look at how clean I am. Look at how good I am. Look at how much better I am than those people. Look at how much better I am than the Goyim, those Gentiles. They, they don't have the, the same revelation of God and Torah that we do. It's just, I mean, that, that's sinful and ugly as well in God's sight. That's self-righteous hypocrisy. But I used to boast about my sin. I used to think what I was doing was cool and good. And, and when I would go to the high holy day services with my family or have to fast on Yom Kippur and then go through the prayers and saying the words over and over, I, I had no interest in what I was doing. I, I, I believed God existed, but I, th I believe that he thought at heart I was a decent person. So here I was lying to my friends, lying to my family, living a sinful life, indulging the flesh, breaking the commandments of God, and at the same time saying, if there's a God, he knows I'm basically a good person. Doesn't it say in Proverbs, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts and spirits? Doesn't it say in Proverbs, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death? Hmm, interesting. So what, what happened is that Friends started praying for me. People I didn't even know started praying for me. And suddenly the things I was boasting about became ugly. And I remember I felt like there was something under my skin I couldn't get to. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had a physical condition and there's some, it's tormenting you, it's under your skin, it's a pain and you can't get to it? That's how I felt in my own heart, my own spirit. That, that I couldn't dig down deep enough to get to the root of the problem. But, but God wanted to have mercy on me. And God was bringing me to a, a recognition of guilt so that I could be forgiven. Now, here's what's so amazing, friends. It was not based solely on the power of my repentance. It was not based solely on my own efforts and energy. It was not based solely on my hard work because my hard work is not good enough. It, it, it's like trying to, it's, it's like your hands are muddy and you keep trying to clean your body with the muddy hands. You're just spreading the mud all over. There must be mercy and there must be atonement for our sin because God is not just a merciful God, but a just God. And I remember talking to a Satmar rabbi one time very, very nice gentleman in Brooklyn. So ultra-Orthodox Jew for those not familiar with Satmar. And I asked him, it was shortly after Yom Kippur, shortly after Day of Atonement. So not immediately, just hours after in this case, but a few days after. And, and I remember, I remember when I was speaking with him that, and as I'm talking to you now, I realized that I had a phone, committed the cardinal sin of radio, that I had a phone turned on next to me. My apologies for those that just heard that sound. I was going to let it go away, but okay, thankfully it didn't ring. Thankfully it didn't ring. Okay. <clears throat> I was talking to the Satmar Chassid, and I said to him, are you sure that you've been forgiven? Are you sure that your sins were forgiven? You pleaded for mercy. You asked for forgiveness. A again, Psalm 32 from David, Asrei Nesui Pesha Kesui Chata'a. Truly happy is, is the man who's, whose transgression is forgiven. It's, it's literally carried in Hebrew. It's carried, means it's, it's been carried away. It's been borne away. The guilt of it has been borne away. Kasui chata'ah. 
that his, his, his sin has been covered. So God doesn't see it anymore, all right? So what, what happened was I was talking to this man, and I said, are you sure your sins are forgiven? And he said this, very sincere, very honorable, but also found very sad. He, he said this to me. He said, I have to see how sincere my repentance is. In other words, the next time I see a woman, do I look at her the wrong way? And, and the next time I'm confronted with this situation, do I respond the right way? Now, that's totally honorable. And then the New Covenant writings have a similar concept, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Uh, this was what Shaul, Paul said, prove your repentance by your deeds. Those who want to look it up, find it in, in Acts chapter 26, verse 20. Yohanan Hamad Beal, better known as John the Baptist, John the Immerser. He said something similar, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Show the genuineness of your repentance by a changed life. So that concept is something that I appreciate and relate to and understand. In other words, as Jewish tradition says, the one who says, I'm going to, I'm going to sin and then say, I'm sorry, and then sin again and repent, sin again. Words, the whole reason I'm going to repent is just to get mercy so I can go sin again. That person will not receive forgiveness. I agree that if we're hypocritical and double-minded, God sees that and God knows that, and he will not respond with forgiveness if he knows simply we're, we're asking for a clean slate so we can go out and dirty it again. In other words, we're not asking sincerely for forgiveness, but if it depends on how perfectly you repent, you'll never be forgiven because no human repentance is totally perfect for life in every area. Maybe you fix this area, maybe you overcome lustful thoughts here, but have you overcome covetous thoughts here? Maybe you overcame self-righteous pride here, but have you overcome lack of compassion here? And here's what's interesting. Compared to ourselves, we can be very righteous. I can be much better than you, much holier than you, or you can be much holier than me. Uh, and, and, and compared to ourselves, we can be pretty good. But compared to God, because he's the standard, he never said compare yourselves to yourselves, did he? With him as the standard, friends, we all fall short. We all fall miserably short. There's the confession in the book of Isaiah that all of our righteous deeds are just like a filthy rag, just like a menstrual cloth in God's sight. That's the best that we offer in ourselves. You say, well, I'm dependent completely on the mercy of God. I'm dependent completely on the goodness of God. That's positive. And, and we know as we come in repentance, asking him for mercy, and as a traditional Jew, you do that every single day, not just on Yom Kippur, but every single day, you ask for mercy. The fact is that something is still missing. Something is missing. And that's why there's a sacrificial system. Now, I'm going to come to that a little bit more when we look at this week's Torah portion and then when we look at some verses about Yom Kippur Day of Atonement in Scripture. But I, I, want, to, I want to look you in the eye, so to say. If you're listening, give me your best ear. If you're watching, look right at me. But I want to look you in the eye and say this. I am clean before God, not because of my own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of the Messiah. I am forgiven this moment before God, not because my conduct has been without fault, without blemish, without sin for the last day or month or year or decade, but because of the righteousness and faithfulness of the Messiah. And, and it is by his emunah. So it is my faith in his faithfulness, God's faithfulness, Messiah's faithfulness that I live, not by my righteousness, not by my best efforts, because I know even in the midst of my best efforts, even in the midst of the holiest day I've ever lived in my life, madly in love with God, caring about my neighbor, praying diligently, keeping God's commandments, the very best that I ever executed that, the, the, the day that was almost like heaven on earth, if the full light of God shone on me, a lot of things would be missing. 
a lot of things would be amiss. And I would find that I had fallen terribly, terribly short. Remember what happens to Job, Eov, in Hebrew, in the Bible? That he is described as a righteous, God-fearing man. That no one else on the planet was like Job. Nobody. Job was absolutely exceptional. He stood out to the point that God himself commended him and said, there's no body on the earth like my servant Job. And when he was tested in the most extraordinary, horrific, mind-boggling ways, he persevered, he glorified God, he didn't sin. Then when his friends came and began to wrongly accuse him and misunderstand the nature of his sufferings, and think that somehow he was guilty, and that's why he was going through these things. When, when all of this happened, he began to get angry. He began to lash out. He began to question God's goodness. He even accused God in the midst of his pain and agony. Someone suffer, some, summed it up like this, that his friends thought that he was suffering because of his sin. That was 100% false. On the flip side, it was his suffering that caused him to sin. So here we have this extraordinarily righteous man, Job, and yet going through a certain trial, not so much the trial between him and God, but then provoked by his well-meaning friends, but his friends in a straight jacket, jacket of religious tradition where they, they, they only had two options. If, if you're righteous, you're blessed. If you're wicked, you're cursed. Things are going bad for you, so you must be bad. That was the straitjacket of their theology, which had some biblical truth, but didn't have the full heart of God. So, so what happens is this. He ends up challenging God. He ends up being right in his own eyes to the point that he questions the rightness of God. And then God speaks out of the whirlwind. And God never answers Job's questions. But God shows Job how great he is, how wondrous he is how beyond comprehension his creation is, and then his dominance and control over even the, the worst and, and most monstrous beings on the earth in the physical or spiritual realm. And, and Job is completely humbled. He, he puts his hand on his mouth. He said, I, I spoke things I, I, I was not aware of. And, and he says literally in Hebrew, I am, I am small. I am small. And then says some words that, that different Jewish traditions have different ways of translating and different Christian translators have different ways. But he basically says, I recant. I, I take back everything I said. And, and I repent either in dust and ashes, in other words, just in this dust heap and in the ashes of repentance, or I repent seeing I am just dust and ashes. I'm just a frail human being. That's what happens when someone as righteous and godly as Job has an encounter with God. As we said, Isaiah, when he encounters God, we don't know for sure, but it could well be that he was well into his prophetic ministry. He was well into his prophetic ministry when he had this vision of God. It's chapter 6 in the book of Isaiah. Ezekiel gets his call. That's chapter one of his book. Jeremiah gets his call. That's chapter one of his book. So is this Isaiah getting his prophetic calling and he just puts it there? Or has he already been in prophetic ministry for years? That would be more likely. So he's already a prophet, a man of God, a holy man. And now he goes into the presence of the perfectly holy God and he's undone. Oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I've seen God, and I'm a wicked sinner living in the midst of a people who are wicked. Our perspective changes. You know, in the New Covenant writings, there's, there's an account about Peter, Peter the fisherman, and, and he was a believer in Jesus the Messiah. And Yeshua, Jesus Yeshua, goes out takes them out in the boat to fish. It's the wrong time, the wrong place. But he says, just do what I'm saying. Peter and his colleagues do it, and, and they catch a miraculous catch of fish. It's so massive that their boat begins to sink, and the, the, the boat of their colleagues begins to sink. And at that moment, 
Peter in a boat on the Sea of Galilee with Yeshua. What does he say? Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Oh, okay. First, where is Yeshua going to go? Where is Jesus going to go? They're on, they're on, oh, yeah, he could walk out on the water, but that's not the issue. They didn't know that, all right? So he's in a boat in the Sea of Galilee, but Peter's so overwhelmed, he just, I can't take it. I, I, see, my, I see my sin. Now, now, please hear me. Please hear me. <clears throat> this is really important. The miracle indicated to him who he was in the boat with. And when he recognized the holiness of the Son of God, he saw his un, his own unholiness. So here it is. It's immediately after Yom Kippur. Immediately after Yom Kippur, you finished your fast. You, you, you've got Sukkot to look forward to, time of celebration, tabernacles for a traditional Jew, Simchat Torah culminating with the celebration of the Torah, time of rejoicing. And in some places, even drinking, getting a little tipsy. But in your heart of hearts, in your heart of hearts, in the presence of a holy God, do you know that you know that you know your sins are forgiven? He said, well, I ask for mercy. I have to trust for mercy. I, I, I said I was sorry. I repented. Now I'm going to move forward. Well, what happens when you blow it again? You have to wait till Yom Kippur? What happens for the record to get set straight? Doesn't Jewish tradition even say that your sins are a talui, they're, they're suspended, forgiveness is suspended until there's repentance or restitution has to be made and the Day of Atonement? Hey, let, let me take you back. It's, it's 2018 as I speak to you, September 2018. Let me take you back to October of 1975, Yom Kippur, I believe it was in the month of October. I had been following Jesus as the Messiah at that point for four years. I had been meeting on and off with Lubavitch Hasidim, ultra-Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn that did outreach to young Jewish people like me and older Jewish people that were not traditional. We had spent hours talking together on several different occasions. And now, this time, I, I was going to spend Yom Kippur with the Lubavitch family. You say, why Yom Kippur? Well, they would invite me for Shabbat, but I used to go to church on Friday nights, and I didn't miss church for anything. I'm just telling you this is my story. And I said I could drive there after church service, and, and they said, well, no, we can't allow you to break the Sabbath for us. So when I saw Yom Kippur was falling on a day, when, when I could travel and be with them, uh, they set it up for me to be with a family. So I, I arrive in time for the, the last meal, and then uh, we're going to be in the synagogue fasting, praying through that night, uh, get up the next morning and spend the next morning, all day, all afternoon in the synagogue. And I remember as the hours went on, and I was talking to the people. I was talking there to them about forgiveness and, and after Yom Kippur, how would they feel and, and talking about relationship with God. Now, these are some of the most sincere people on the planet. These are tremendously devoted people. And, and some had came in later. Uh, they had come in later. They'd be called Baalei Tshuva. So literally masters of repentance, meaning those that turned back in repentance and, and became traditional Jews. So they weren't raised traditional and they became traditional. So they found repentance, all right? That would be the concept. But, but what, what happened was this. What happened was this. Uh, most of them were lifelong Lubavitch, raised in the faith. The family I stayed with, of course, that was the case. And when we weren't praying in the synagogue, I was talking to them and asking questions. And then sometimes uh, before the prayer, walking into the synagogue, or just taking a break for a few minutes in the back, talking. And, and what struck me, and here they were with all their sincerity. And they would tell me, okay, here's where you beat your breast. And, and in those days, I, I, was, I was reading Hebrew, but I, I wasn't reading it as fast as they were. And I said, should I read in English or Hebrew? They said, if you read Hebrew, that's better. It's better to do it in Hebrew, even if you don't understand it as well, but it's better to do it in Hebrew. So I was going back and forth, Hebrew and English. And, and what struck me, as the day wore on, 
uh, now late in the afternoon of that of, of Yom Kippur, what struck me was all the sincerity, all the effort, and yet they did not know forgiveness the way I knew it. And they did not walk with God the way I did. Here I was some kid from a non-traditional background, conservative Jew from Long Island, heavy drug user as a teenager, now following Jesus, going to a church. So I had not at that point recovered a lot of the Jewishness of my faith and, and understood the Jewish roots of my faith. Not that it's a sin to go to a church, I don't mean that. But, but I'm saying I, I was not nearly as connected with my Jewish heritage and roots as I've been over the years at that point. And yet, as we talked, as we interacted, it was so clear we were in two different worlds. And please understand, I prayed hours every day. I was in the scriptures hours every day. I lived a very zealous life. I was telling everyone I could about my faith. I was interacting every opportunity I had. In other words, I was not some hypocrite just living some superficial life. I was deeply, deeply devoted. So I'm not saying that I just found an excuse for fleshly living. What I'm saying is forgiveness, cleansing, washing, intimacy, knowing that I knew I was right with God, knowing that the burden of guilt was gone, was gone, was completely gone. Why? You see, God's perfectly righteous and just, and the whole sacrifice system was life for life, the guilty for the innocent. You see? The guilty for the innocent. Messiah took our place. The perfectly righteous one died for our sins so that we being forgiven, we being cleansed, we receiving mercy could now live a brand new life. Friend, you can be totally forgiven, not just for a moment, but for life. And wherever you do fall short, you look to him for mercy and cleansing, receive it and go on with a clean heart, with a pure heart, with a changed life. That is one reason Messiah came and died foundationally to bring us atonement and to demonstrate the love of God and to break the power of sin and death and give us eternal hope, eternal life. If you call out to him now, it will be more effective than all your fasting, all your praying, because he, the perfectly righteous one, has done it. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for joining us on The Real Messiah. Michael Brown here right after Yom Kippur. Can I take you into Leviticus, the 16th chapter? Leviticus chapter 16. This is not this week's Torah portion, as you know, but these are passages from the scripture when God gave the children of Israel the method of keeping Yom Kippur, the method of observing Yom Kippur. So, so notice there were two goats that were selected, one to be killed and one to be sent out into the wilderness. It's called in scripture for Azazel. Is that the goat that departs? It was Azazel, some being, some entity, became known as the scapegoat. But, but it, it says in verse 15, verse 15 uh, about Aaron, he shall then slaughter the people's goat of sin offering, bring its blood behind the curtain, and do with its blood as he has done with the blood of the bull. He shall sprinkle it over the cover and in front of the cover, or the so-called mercy seat, the kaporet. Then it says this in verse 16, al hakodesh mitumot b'nei Yisrael mipishehem totam ohel moed itam bitoch tumotam. All right, so thus shall he purge the shrine the, the, the holy place of the uncleanness and transgression of the Israelites, whatever their sins. And he shall do the same for the tent of meeting, which abides with them in the midst of their uncleanness. All right, then it continues. Uh, when he goes in to make expiation in the shrine, in the holy place, nobody else shall be in the tent of meeting till he comes out. When he has made expiation for himself and his household and for the whole congregation of Israel. To read in Hebrew, so when he's made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole congregation of Israel, he'll, he'll go out to the altar that's before the Lord, all right, and he'll, he'll purge that. He'll make atonement for that. 
So he'll, he'll expiate it for the sins of the people that have polluted it, all right? And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the goat and apply it to each of the horns of the altar, all right? So it, it, it then goes on, and the rest of the blood he shall sprinkle on it with his finger seven times. And, and then it says, it says this, Thus he shall cleanse it of the uncleanness of the Israelites and consecrate it. So that's the, the goat that's killed. Now verse 20, right? So when he's finished purging the holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar. So, so these don't need atonement the way humans do. These are polluted by the sin of Israel, so he now has to cleanse them. It's like if you go into a smoke-filled room and you come out smelling like smoke, or, or you walk through a, you know, a dust storm and you're covered with dust. So the altar, the holy items were polluted by the sin of Israel. They were purged, how? By blood, all right? And then the, the people's sins were atoned, how? By blood. And, and then what happens? So then Aaron takes the live goat, all right? Verse 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it. All right, so he will confess over it all of the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all of their sins. So he will he'll put them now literally on the head of the goat, and it shall be sent off to the wilderness through a designated man. So two goats, th these were central on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement. Two goats, one goat, what was the purpose of the one goat? The purpose of the one goat was its blood was shed because atonement is in the blood. The center of the atonement system in Israel was blood atonement, substitutionary atonement. So there is a blood sacrifice. So symbolically, this animal takes the place of the children of Israel. It dies in their place. An unblemished animal acceptable for sacrifice dies in their place. And then by its blood, atonement is made. Now, this is coupled by the repentance of the people of Israel. So there's two sides. There's the atonement side and the repentance side, right? And then there's the second goat. And Aaron lays his hands on that goat. So this is symbolic of transfer, transferring through the laying on of hands. All right. Aaron lays his hands on that goat. And then he sends that goat into the wilderness. He confesses over it all the sins. So the iniquities, avon is, is, is wickedness, guilt, iniquity. And then pesha, that's transgression. This is an, an act of rebellion. And, and, and then chata. This is an act of, of sin. So iniquity, rebellion, sin, falling short in every way. He confesses the sins of Israel on the head of that goat, lays his hands on it, puts the sins on it symbolically, and it carries it out into the wilderness. So there is the goat dying in our place, and there is the goat carrying away our sins. And then what do we do on our end? We repent. Now, here is the big problem. There has not been a temple. For most of our history, there has not been a temple where we can offer sacrifices. Let me say it again. For most of our history as a Jewish people, and devout Jews are more aware of this than anyone, praying daily for the rebuilding of the third temple and for the ability to offer sacrifices again in obedience to God, that we have not had a functioning temple where we could offer sacrifices. You say, well, we have substitutes. Isn't it interesting? that that which is so central, so foundational to atonement in the Bible is something that we say, well, God gave us substitutes. I, I can guarantee you this, friends, guarantee you this, and, and you take me up on it. Take me up on it. I'm not taking calls tonight. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I'm not taking calls tonight. But you take me up on this challenge, all right? We are explicitly told that we need this blood atonement. We are explicitly told this is what happens on Yom Kippur. Show me anything equally explicit anywhere in the Bible that says that we don't need these sacrifices. Show me something equally explicit in the Tanakh, in our Hebrew Bible, where it says that if we don't have a temple, we can do this or this or this. 
You say, well, what, what about Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings 8 and, 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 uh, and, and in, in 2 Chronicles 6, where he prays the long prayer and, and even specifically says, you know, well, what if we go into exile and we pray towards this temple and you have mercy? He's not talking about the whole nation being exiled and the temple being destroyed. No, no, that, we know that explicitly from the text. He's talking about some of the people going to exile and they pray back towards the functioning temple, which God has established as what? A Beit Zevach, according to Second Chronicles 7. So they pray back towards this functioning temple where sacrifices are still being offered by the, by the high priest, and God will have mercy. All right? So there's always the two sides. There's the atonement side. There's the repentance side. It's not either or. It's both and. And then Second Chronicles 7 explicitly says, but if, if we cross the line and sin in such a way that the temple that he's going to destroy the temple, then the whole world will know that God's angry with us and has sent us into exile because of our sins. It doesn't say pray back to the ruins of a non-functioning temple and you receive forgiveness without sacrifice. No, it says there is no national forgiveness. <clears throat> so either there is no national forgiveness for us and we can pray and we can repent, we can beat our breast and we can cry out and we can, we can do everything we know how to do and we can fast and we can be so sincere and we can seek to make things right with man and make things right with God and, and do better, all of which is highly commendable, but we still need atonement and we still need a sin bearer. And, and either God in his mercy has sent the Messiah to do these very things and therefore we do not need a functioning temple. And we do not need blood sacrifices because the one to whom the sacrifices point has come and died in our place. The righteous one has taken our place. He has laid his life down because does God really want the blood of, of an animal? Here is a righteous martyr saying, let me be the atonement of Israel. All right. And, and, and maybe you went through the, the ritual of Kaparis, and maybe you swung a chicken around your head, and maybe you said, this is my exchange, this is my atonement, this, 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 is, this is my substitute. Maybe you said that, but God never set that up. God never set that up, and does that chicken really have that power? Isn't it rather the power of a righteous life lived by the Messiah, our intercessor, who says, let me be the atonement for Israel? Let me climb up into the breach as Moses did and stand between the judgment of God and a guilty people and say, instead, blot me out of your book. I'll take the penalty. I'll take the fall so that they can go free. Is repentance required? Of course, of course. You turn to God asking for mercy. You turn to God asking for forgiveness. You turn to God asking for cleansing. You turn to God, asking him to remove the guilt of sin, but it has been paid for. It is atonement and repentance. So I, I want to say to all of you who still, okay, you're, you're eating your meal. You feel better after eating. There's that sense of relief. You've gone through the fast. You're leaning on the mercy of God. But if you're missing the Messiah, you're missing the mercy of God. He's poured it out and your conscience can be clean and your sins forgiven and a deep, deep sense of assurance beyond anything you have ever known. It can be yours. All my friends listening in New York, take this to heart. Every Jewish person listening around the world, take this to heart. Every follower of Jesus listening, watching, please tell your Jewish friends, tune in to the real Messiah. Tune in. Hear the message about the truth of Messiah. Now, Here's something really interesting. And, and I, I just want to I, I ask this question honestly. If you're a traditional Jew, I, I want to ask this question honestly. I want you to just think this through with me, okay? I want you to think this through with me. The Torah portion this week, as we come to the end of the cycle of reading the Torah over a one-year period, is, is Hazinu, which is give ear. All right, it is Deuteronomy chapter 32. It begins with the famous words, Hazino Hashemayim v'adabra v'tishma ha'aretz imrefi. All right, so hear, uh, O heavens, let me speak. Let the earth hear the words I utter. Now, we go down to verse 4, speaking about our God, Hatsur, the rock. Tamim Paulo, his deeds are perfect. All his ways are just a faithful God, never false, 
True and upright is he. But now, verse, verse 5, Shichet lo, lo banav mumam, dori ikesh, u fatal to. Children unworthy of him, that cricket, crooked, excuse me, that crooked, perverse generation, their baseness has played him false, all right? And what, what's really interesting in this passage, and I, I just want to scroll down a, a few more verses. Uh, let's, let's go down to, to verse 15. Let's scroll down to, to verse 15 in Deuteronomy 32, and I'll, I'll get to my question. Well, let, let me put my question out first, and then we'll go to verse 15. As it just works out now, all right, Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and now the passage of Scripture you read next is a witness against us. The end of 31, the end of 31, God actually says that this is a witness against us, that we are to have this, this word, this witness against us, to testify against us for our sin in years to come. Okay? So here's, here's what I'm wondering about. This is just the cycle, the way it's been set up ultimately in Jewish tradition, with the cycle of readings, etc. <clears throat> How does this affect you psychologically? Days after the Day of Atonement, one week after Shabbat Shuvah, the, the Sabbath of repentance, so immediately after Rosh Hashanah and right before Yom Kippur, how does it affect you psychologically to be reading God's witness against the sinfulness of our people? Immediately after us pleading for mercy, immediately after us asking for forgiveness, immediately after us confessing verses about God's mercy and God's forgiveness and God's kindness, now we have verses indicting us for our sin. Psychologically, how does that make you feel? So we go back to verse 15, and it says this, speaking of Yeshurun, which is uh, another way of speaking of the, the people of Israel, and ultimately from Arut Yashar having to be upright, so it's ironic. So, Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat and gross and coarse. He forsook the God who made him and spurned the rock of his support. They incensed him with alien things, vexed him with abominations. Verse 17. They sacrificed to demons, no gods, gods they had never known. New ones who came but lately, who stirred not your father's fears. And then verse 18 says this, You neglected the rock that begot you, forgot the God who brought you forth. The Lord saw and was vexed and spurned his sons and daughters. Excuse me, so he said, I, I will hide my countenance from them. God hiding his face and see how they fare in the end. In the Acharit, for their treacherous breed, children with no loyalty in them. They incense me with no gods, vex me with their futilities. I'll incense them with a no folk, vex them with a nation of fools. And then let's skip down to, to verse 28. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 28, verses that will be read in the synagogue this weekend and studied through this week. Kigoi oved et sotema, ve'en bahem tvuna. There are folk void of sense, lacking in all discernment. And then down to verse 36, down to verse 36. Ki adin Adonai amo, val avadav yit necham. So what's it say? For the Lord will vindicate his people. He'll literally judge his people, but in a positive sense. And take vengeance for his servants. He will, he will have mercy on them 
and avenge them. For when he sees that their might is gone and neither bond nor free is left, he'll say, where are their gods, the rock in whom they sought refuge? All right, why do I read this? I read it first to say, isn't it curious that immediately after our time of repentance, the Torah portion on the traditional Jewish reading calendar is one that speaks of our sin, that reminds us of our ugly history. It was prophesied there, but, but we've often lived it out, which is why we've been in exile so long. And from a traditional viewpoint, why the temple still hasn't been rebuilt. But it also says this, God will avenge us. God will act on our behalf. God will rise up on our behalf when, when he sees there's no strength left, when he sees we're at the end of ourselves. Can I say something that may surprise you? Many people will say, well, you found religion because you were weak. You found religion because you were you needed a crutch. You, you found religion because you, you were weak in yourself. <laughs> I've had friends say, look, I don't need a crutch. I need to be raised from the dead. I didn't just need a crutch. I need more than a crutch. We're, we're lost in sin. We, we need to be resurrected by the mercy of God from, from spiritual deadness. But I fought, I fought tenaciously. I fought with all my might against repenting, against following God, but God in his mercy chased me down and brought conviction in my life. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I needed I needed forgiveness, and he forgave me and transformed me. And I've been living in the light of that transformation by his grace ever since. It's interesting that this is God's prescription when he sees there's no strength left, when there's no more boasting, no more talking about how righteous we are, how good we are. Look at the amazing people of Israel. Look at how we fight all our wars. Look at how we win all our battles. Look at how we don't need foreign armies coming in and fighting our battles for us. Look at how we pray. Look at how we observe the Sabbath. Look at how good, look at how righteous we are. He says, no, it, when there's no strength, when people realize in ourselves we can't save ourselves, when we even realize as the people of Israel that, that we can't ultimately save ourselves from our enemies. In the time of great need, what does it say in, in, in Isaiah 59? That, that God's own hand is stretched out and God's own arm brings salvation because we cannot save ourselves. Friends, that's when we will see the Messiah coming in the clouds of heaven. Not just someone among us that becomes the Messiah through his good works. We say, wow, he must be the Messiah. Look at what he's done. But one who comes down from the clouds of heaven, the Son of God in human form, because we need a Savior. There's only one Savior, only one Savior, only one Deliverer, and that's God. So God comes and the person of his son, the Messiah. When we see him in the clouds of heaven, it will be when we've reached our breaking point. It, it will be when we recognize we have no strength left. It will be when we recognize we cannot save ourselves. It will be when we recognize that only by the mercy of God, only by the atonement made by God, only by the sacrifice of the Messiah can we be saved. When we recognize that, we look back to the cross and realize that was, that was not our enemy. Many Gentiles made Jesus into the enemy of the Jewish people. They created a, a Jesus in their own image who was no longer Jewish. They, they, they created a Jesus that hated the Jewish people. They created a religion that strayed from the foundations that God gave us in, in Torah and the prophets and the Psalms and, and given to us in the New Covenant writings, a, a Jewish-rooted foundation. They created a savior in their own image and turned against the Jewish people. But put that aside because that's not the real Messiah. The real Messiah, a Jewish rabbi named Yeshua, laid his life down as the perfect sacrifice. And just as there were two goats on the Day of Atonement, one that died to forgive us, another that bore our sins and took them away, the Messiah did both on the cross. As the perfectly righteous one, he laid down his life and said, Father, forgive them but they do not know what they do. I will pay for every one of their sins. And then he carried our sins on his own shoulders and took them away so that we bear the guilt of them no more and experience the amazing beauty of forgiveness. 
And maybe you're a secular Jew and you said, well, I fast it. And so you really think that's it? You party, do what you want, live how you want all year, selfish, put yourself first, fast, pray a few prayers and all goes away. No, there's justice. Someone has to pay for those sins. The good news, the Messiah did. Friends, if you want to find out more about Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, go to our Real Messiah website, realmessiah.com. Write us a note, say, I want to find out more. How, I, I want, I'm curious. I want to know more. We're not going to sell your email, give out your address to anybody. Let us help you however we can. All right, stay here for this special announcement.